The Sustainability Now Telesummit is honored to share audacious ideas and innovative solutions from more than 30 experts from around the globe. Learn how we can work together to shape a world that works. Here's your host, Mira Rubin. Welcome back to the Sustainability Now Telesummit, Shaping a World that Works. I am very excited to introduce Jay Potter, environmental innovator, entrepreneur, finance wizard, and pioneer in the renewable energy and clean technology sector. Jay is co-founder and director of ECOR, a global leader in circular economy solutions. And over the past 10 years, Jay has successfully directed or placed over $80 million of capital directed to clean technology, renewable energy startups, and early stage companies. Jay, thank you so much for being here with us. Love to be here. This is great, Mira. And thank you for what you're doing. You're really pioneering uh, new, new markets in the green sector. And so why don't you just start out by telling us a little bit about what ECOR is. And we're going to talk about uh, opportunities that are arising as people are becoming more environmentally aware. So ECOR is a perfect example of that. Yeah, and it really kind of, I guess it starts with, um, as we all have our own personal journeys that 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 kind of shape, you know, who and what we are and, and how we find the intestinal fortitude <laughs> yes. to, you know, try and overcome these incredible uh, obstacles uh, that everybody wants, but no one really wants to, you know, have to put in the energy that's required to bring them about. Um, which, of course, is the, is, the, is the global battle between the incumbent and the innovator or the disruptor. Right. Um, you know, you don't fix something that isn't broke. Um, and, of course, nobody wants to admit that anything's broke if it's making money. That's right. That's, and that's where the, that's where the twist uh, comes in. And I, I was introduced to it uh, early in my career, uh, really as an investor and investment banker, um, started off on the dark side in the oil and gas industry. And there's one thing about the oil and gas industry that teaches you about sustainability, and that's this ugly word called depletion. And when you produce oil, every barrel you produce is one less there. And it's a battle in that business to try to overcome uh, you know, those, uh, th that challenge. And in, in 1999 and 2000, I had my own, what I call a BGO, which is the blinding glimpse of the obvious, um, where I had a whole bunch of investors that were willing to risk their capital uh, for a exorbitant, uh, uh, hopeful, uh, often disastrous, but um, uh, you know, return in, in exploration for oil and gas. And I went to these investors and I said, instead of us trying to hit the next oil well, why don't we get in front of the next technology uh, that, can, that can deliver that kind of return and more? Uh, many of them were not interested because they were aware that, that the magic of what oil and gas provides is that you either win or you lose in a very short period of time. You don't have to wonder, you know, as the dice are rolling down the table, they're not in slow motion over three to five to seven to 10 years that it might take uh, for a winning disruptive innovation to catch hold in the marketplace. Uh, so one of the areas that I found most intriguing, of course, being from energy, I was focused on energy. And that energy um, I found in research, I couldn't believe what I found in the waste industry. It is without question the most singularly, even today, the most inefficient market and industry uh, in the world. Um, it's astonishing. Um, and when you start to look at the numbers, and I'm very much a numbers guy, the numbers are overwhelming. Uh, there certainly just is not enough places for us to operate as we are um, in such a wasteful manner. Uh, and when you start to look at the, you know, what goes into a landfill, um, I looked at it from an energy perspective because putting it in the ground versus at least converting it into, into, its, into its energy components certainly made more sense. 
Uh, however, in building a beautiful technology in that space, I came head on to the politics and the bureaucracy that had been put in place by waste management and other companies that said the only good place for waste is in a hole. Um, and that became an, a, in, an insurmountable um, objective. And, but I did not lose my appreciation for what was in the waste stream. I'm going to ask you to back up so that people have a context to understand your conversation about this a little bit more. Sure. Just give us a really foundational definition of ECOR and what you're up to and talk about the circular economy. Too much backstory. Okay, so um, my appreciation for the waste industry is that most of what goes in the, in the waste stream is cellulose. It all started from a living product, whether it's um, a tree, um, a stem of wheat or oat, um, all the things that go into making food and food production. These are all agricultural waste streams that are globally uh, are either disposed of uh, in a hole or burned. Uh, in, in oftentimes, and unfortunately, are open burned, which obviously delivers a tremendous amount of uh, particulates, large particulates uh, into the atmosphere, and of course, CO2. Um, and what a waste, because they have great value. And we were able to find a technology and partnership that we developed with the United States Department of Agriculture and the Forest Products Lab that had been there for many, many years, but never commercialized. And I recognized that, that with the massive increase in, in population, and along with that massive increase in population was a massive increase in, in, in wages in the undeveloped world, Mexico, uh, China, India, and so on. These are, these are areas where just between now and 2028, it's predicted that the number of middle-class consumers will nearly double. Mm. Well, what are they going to want? They're going to want what we all have, which is beds, a real bed, maybe even a floor. And my God, maybe even a roof. Um, and these are things that have to be addressed. And where are those resources going to come from? And so when we started this in 2007 and 2008 and advancing the technology, obviously we were very attuned uh, to the, the thought process of cradle to cradle. And of course the, uh, and of course the green um, building industry and it's in, in its very nascent stages. In fact, uh, my partner, Robert Noble, was one of the pioneers of the U.S. Green Building uh, uh, movement. Um, he's been a pioneer for 35 years in the, same, in the same thought process, but way ahead of his time, which, meant, which of course means just frustration um, because it was too early for the market to accept it. But then along came this wonderful woman called Ellen MacArthur, and she started, she took the elements of these deep thinkers and provided a recipe and a, and a action plan about making the circular economy um, viable. And that is now, if anybody's unaware, that has now been, uh, is now a foundational component in virtually every government in the world uh, and every major corporation. Um, so Jay, take a second so that you uh, folks understand what circular economy is. So can you give us a foundation definition? Well, everything, everything that is made, everything that is made starts with intention. And the intention is I want an object, a product. So let's just take, you know, a cell phone. So the designer, his first obligation when he said, I'm going to make a cell phone, his first obligation is what am I going to make it out of? So first he has to choose the material component. Then he has to make a decision on how he designs the component, those, the, uh, the additional components that make up a cell phone. Is he going to make it, the cell phone so that at its end of life, it is easy and designed for it to be taken apart. Right, or repaired. Or repaired. So that, those, so that those components and those materials uh, don't leave the, the active marketplace. So one of the things that we've all been subject to that has created a big part of the problem that we're facing is planned obsolescence. Correct. Where, where products are designed 
to need to be replaced, where they cannot be upgraded, they cannot be repaired. Uh, they, it's cheaper to buy a new one than to repair an old one. Well, and again, that starts with design. Exactly. Okay? Which starts and with intention. And intention. Yeah. So Bill McDonough did the best articulation. He says, it says you have the biological loop and you have the technical loop. And just because something is maybe a less attractive chemical, that chemical should be designed such that it remains in the technical loop. Whereas in all the biological products, which is, again, if you look at most of all the things that we use, you know, there's only six different or five different real resources. You have stone and rock and cement in one. You have glass, which, of course, is kind of related to the stone, rock and everything. Then you have, uh, then you have um, uh, plastics. Uh, and then you have, uh, you have steel and all of its alloys and you have wood, okay? There's really only five whole things in the whole world from a resource perspective for us to manage. The fact is that they then have millions of, of alter permutations in how they are adjusted uh, for whatever the market application is. And that's where the intention comes. Right. Then and when it, we, we go back to the concept, like just like a foundation concept of circular economy is really biomimicry. It's looking at nature and saying everything in nature has a cycle so that at the end of one cycle, that that waste becomes food for the next cycle. A tree, a tree is always a perfect example. It drops the leaves, the leaves decompose into uh, into carbon and enzymes, which feed the root system and allow the tree to continue to to uh, grow. Obviously, consuming CO two, generating oxygen. I mean, it's it's all the answers are there. Right. Um, and in fact, biomimicry um, happens to be one of the solutions of which we spent a lot of time on in the in the technology, um, so that we can do what we do. And what we do is we're able to take cellulose fiber of almost any kind. Um, and I've got some pictures I can show here in a moment, um, but we're able to take it and manipulate and excite those fibers and get them to marry each other without the need of a glue um, or a binder. So right now, all of us in our built environments, and I, I, I a, there was a, a, a panel speaker some, some uh, a year or so ago that said officially, uh, we have become um, an indoor species. Yeah, that we are no longer part of the uh, part of the uh, culture uh, at the base level of which we've been in for thousands of years. Uh, that we spend ninety and ninety five percent of our time indoors. And if you start to look at that, everything that is indoors, from the floor, the walls, to the furniture, to the ceilings, it's all made primarily of wood and or cellulo cellulose-based materials. And all of them have been designed and built um, for, this, for their lowest cost and highest performance. And that means they're all chemicals. Right. And they're all, they're all, they're all off-gassing nasty nasties called volatile organic compounds that they're now finding that are the root of so many of our ailments, uh, from from cancer to respiratory diseases to uh, asthma to I mean, it, it, it wouldn't be a shock to me if we actually found that all these things are, of course, interconnected yeah. uh, with each other, um, and 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 the damage it causes. So we take those materials and we can make a substitute for those materials that don't have those toxins. And the killer part, and this is a mandate for anybody that's in sustainability, you have you can't just make a better product. It will fail. You have to make a better product that is lower cost. It literally has to be better in all aspects in order to overcome the economics and cost of integrating that change into any supply chain. So let's let's actually back up and Define the e-core product so people understand what is the product that you create. And then we can back up 
and explain how you arrived at this brilliant solution. Well, we, we came up with it, obviously, many years ago, and we started introducing it to the market. We built But what is it? Well, it's a, it's a panel, okay? So it's, it's, and we have complete control of its density and thickness, so it could be 19 millimeters thick, or as our standard is, two and a half millimeters thick. And everything that we have, so a wood floor, as an example, is oftentimes about, say, a, a three quarters of an inch thick, and it is made with various layers of different types of wood-based composites that allow it to have structure that is designed not to swell or shrink. Um, and then they put a beautiful veneer on the top of it. Now, that material is a bunch of really nasty stuff that cannot be recycled, that every single bit of it, every single piece of mass-produced furniture in the world, as an example, when it's done with its life and nobody wants to reuse it, it ends up in a landfill. And it has a whole bunch of toxic stuff in nasty, it. Nasty, nasty, nasty stuff. Yeah. So if you can find a way that, uh, that you can substitute those materials with something that can be endlessly, endlessly recycled, then it never leaves that biological loop. Right. As soon as you start doing that, you don't cut down trees. It's no longer, as you mentioned earlier, it's no longer viable to use virgin materials because they're less expensive you eliminate that entire thought process. Like right now today, just today, a half a million trees have been cut down today just for newspapers. This year, IKEA is going to consume 2% of every single tree cut in the world. And so what, you, what Eclor product does is it takes all this waste cellulose from all different places. It takes it, makes a slurry of it, compresses it with pressure and heat to create something that replaces chipboard and well, what other kinds of things is it replacing? Plywood, plywood particle board, uh, MDF. Um, and then we started going into other areas because here's another life lesson for me. And that is, again, we invented something that is radically disruptive and we built it and we proved it and we built a commercial facility for it. And guess what? No one cared. Eh, that's not fair. They cared, but it was not ready for prime time. It was not delivered on a platter. It was not meant for and designed specifically for introduction and integration into the marketplace. So that's what we had to do next. And I, and uh, my team and I came up with a, with a not so, uh, not so obvious strategy. And that is we created a business model that was inclusive. In other words, one that. I'm just going to stop you here because, because there are a couple of things I want to make sure that people get out of this interview. First of all, you saw, you saw a big problem. You saw a big waste problem. And you saw that the waste was just increasing and there was all this toxicity. You saw that there was an opportunity to create materials that replace the toxic materials that we're all subject to. And not only did you create a business around that and a product around that, but you also made a disruptive business model. And that's what you're talking about now. So let me just let you go with that. Well, if you can see on this, this is the driver. This is what the world looks like. So this is a massive increase in the middle class population at the same time that we're consuming raw materials, virgin raw materials at, at such an alarming rate. Um, this is not something that can be stopped. This is something that we all have to adjust for. So, you know, how do you, how do you, bring, how do you bring that level, that incredible, huge amount of change? And that was the introduction of the circular economy, saying that the only way that this, to meet the needs uh, and demands of this, po of this radically increased population um, is, to, is to tap into uh, the waste stream and to create these circular uh, components so that, so that um, it's not lost. Otherwise, there won't be a tree standing in the world by 2050. Right. I mean, literally, not a tree. And of course, if there's no trees, there's no insects. If there's no insects, there's no food. I mean, this is dystopian as you get. 
Um, yeah. and, and, and that, of course, you know, can, should put a chill on everybody's, uh, uh, everybody's spine. So we took this idea and said, all the, there's already all this infrastructure and all these other companies that go out and pick up the waste, that go in, deliver it, and separate it, um, and do whatever they can to, to sell it. And they sell it into the recycling industry, which, by the way, has collapsed in the last year and a half because China is no longer a, a uh, developing country. They are now a, their own juggernaut. They have their own recycling programs. So they have been eating 35 or 50% of the world's low grade waste for 35 years. And in, a, in, a, in the magic of a communist society, they said, this is what we do today. This is what we do tomorrow. And they went from 50% to 10% overnight. And now the world... Yeah, it's making everybody wake up, which is a great thing. It's, it's a like, fantastic okay, thing. It is. Right. So how do you wake... How do you take that and introduce a new technology as a solution to that problem? So the very first thing I did was I made... And I'm not sure if you can see this very well. This is a six-pack ring. And this is a six-pack ring made from spent brewer's grain and label tape because you know on every bottle they put a label on it well every label comes with a label backing tape and that label backing tape is virgin fiber that is not recycled because it's just not not recycled it's just it's it's it doesn't have a box to check for a recycling operation because they have cardboard multiple grades of cardboard multiple grades of paper that's what they're focused on Something like label tape is too obscure, costs too much money, but so it ends up in a, it ends up in the waste bin. So we took it and blended it with the spent brewer's grain and made a six pack ring, of which we sent to every director uh, and every CEO of all four hundred operating companies of um, Heineken. Wow! And Heineken, and we chose Heineken because they consider themselves and have since the '60s as being the world's greenest, most sustainable brewer. Huh. So that, that, got, that got a response. And we built on that response um, and started showing them what we can do from a signage perspective. So instead of them, and again, like all companies, uh, and I'll probably get some flack from this if anybody from Heineken sees this interview, Hopefully but um, like all companies, they they use a little bit of green spray paint in their sustainability programs. Yeah. So one of the things I identified was why are you guys using styrene in your, in your, in your signage programs? Cause remember a company like Heineken has like 10 million points of distribution. They put signs and, and uh, point of purchase displays and they, they, every quarter they're covering all those locations. You know, I, <laughs> You're not I, using, you're not listing styrene. I, I, I just have to point out, you know, I think one of the things that you're, is your brilliance is looking around at what's around you and sort of seeing it with a new eye. Like, I don't know how many people would think about Heineken and think about signage. And then think about styrene in, in signage. I mean, that is a new perspective. It's a new way of seeing what's around you that's probably pretty invisible to most people. Well, yeah, if you walk around, and I encourage anybody to walk into any store, and if you look at the amount of marketing um, that, you're, that you're inundated with, from the signs and the banners that hang from the ceilings to, to the cantilevered um, sign in the middle of the aisle, to, I mean, it's it's... It's pretty amazing. And if you notice, they'll change every four to six weeks mm. because they're marketing programs. So you market for Easter, you market for 4th of July, you market for Halloween, you market for Christmas, um, Hanukkah. You know, I mean, you're, you're, it's just constant. And all of those are virgin materials. Wow. And, in, and almost in all cases, the materials that are chosen, back to intention, are chosen first and foremost for their economics. What is the cheapest material we can print on? And that's where we started putting down our fight. 
And Heineken said, you know what? There's a bigger problem than our materials for signage. It's the materials we use in our secondary packaging. In other words, all the materials used to protect the product in shipment. Oh, wow. Pallets, slip sheets, tear sheets, pads, trays. And the numbers are overwhelming. So just like one brewery in uh, Heineken in Mexico produces every year 200 million pads. And what's a pad? A pad is just simply a thin piece of corrugate that sits on top of a, of a case of beer that then a tray of a, that holds the case of beer goes on top of. And then another pad, tray, pad, tray. And they produce 200 million of those a year just in one brewery. Now, the cost for that is only like two and a half, three cents. So it's almost immaterial from a single use perspective, but when you start looking at it from a global perspective, it's hundreds of millions of dollars. And at the same time, the waste stream that they have, which is varying, but all very similar, spent brewer grain, which is either wheat, hop, oat, you know, whatever, whatever agricultural fiber you're using to make your beer, which of course now there's thousands of beers, mm -hmm. you know, they got honey, peanut butter. I mean, my good, they're, they're infusing everything into it. Um, and the entire production comes with a massive waste stream. Well, all those point of purchase displays and all those signs, what happens to them when they're done? Garbage. New one goes up. So the idea was to Heineken was you can close the, your own loop. You are the same group that's coming out to put up those signs, to put up the new one. Well, why doesn't he take back the old one? And this way, in, uh, in, in, in doing that, I just hit something. Hold on. That, um, that, the, that the sign that he collects that no longer has value now just becomes feedstock that then might make a pad. And the pad, when it is gets to its point of distribution, it's right now thrown into the recycle bin, which now because of China has no buyer, it goes into the landfill. So now he can pick that up and that comes back into the, into the system and maybe it becomes a tap handle or a bar stool or um, a lamp or a table or a box or it just kind of goes on and on and on. Uh, and so that is, is our mission, in, in, and that is, is to go and help uh, not just these major corporations, but also the, the cities in which, they, uh, in which they live in, who are suffering horribly right now, losing millions and millions of dollars on their recycling programs that they have spent many tens of millions of dollars in developing the culture and infrastructure of which to support Recycling, which now no longer has a buyer, which means they're now having to spend more money to landfill uh, these. And well, the landfill is limited. I mean, the landfill is getting filled. So well, we, have, we have in on the east, north on the east coast of the United States. Um, the last numbers I saw says that there is uh, before the recycling collapse, there was roughly eight years of life. That's it. Eight years of capacity remaining. Well, now that they're pushing in all these recycled materials in it, that's only going to accelerate and terminate that. But here's the nasty thing that's happening. You have places like Arkansas and Mississippi, which are far more lax with respect to their environmental uh, standards uh, and are in need of money because they're not as, they're not as you know, productive economically or, or, or from a GDP perspective. And so now you have literally hundred trains long of waste material being shipped all the way down into Mississippi uh, and, and uh, Alabama and the South uh, of which to be disposed of. And I'm also including in that uh, human waste because the wastewater treatment facilities in the Northeast are at capacity. And so now they're putting human waste on, on rail cars and shipping it down there. I mean, this is, it's and, by the way, and by the way, just as a little side note, um, and thanks to the Dutch, which are our greatest supporters, um, they've, we've even now converted the dry matter, 
So when you take human waste, they separate the liquids and process those. They separate that from the solids, which they, which they kill all the microbes and dry. We're now turning that into panels for industrial use. And in, it's, the, the Dutch are brilliant. Maybe it's because 70% of their entire country is below sea level. They think uh, a little faster than the rest of us. Um, because they're, they're, they, they see the, they see the end and the, and the unpleasantries so much are, are so much more vivid, yeah. uh, uh, for them. Yeah. So, you know, these, this technology is, is, um, I'm determined. I am not going to ever give up. Um, I believe that this technology or something similar to it, if it's not ours, I'm plenty happy with it being somebody else's, but that this is the recycling is the foundation of everything green, everything mm-hmm. sustainable, everything. It is the it is but the true cost. recycling because what you just pointed up is that recycling as it exists here is really a farce. It's kind of a for the most part, the way that we've currently been recycling is a feel good exercise for consumers. Or a path of least resistance. It's just it's an easier, it's an easy thing to push it off someplace else. And the Chinese have been saying, well, We'll take it. And they've built multi-bazillion dollar businesses out of that um, since China shipped all that product that we all bought. It all came in a box. Well, that box came from the fiber of which they were buying from us. Well, they don't need to do that anymore. Uh, and the rest of us have to adapt. And if recycling fails and, the, and we lose the foundation to all things sustainable, that's a big problem. Now you accelerate that dystopian uh, outcome. Yeah, you know, it brings to mind to me several, well, years and years ago, there was a strike that trash collectors, Mm -hmm. garbage collectors went on strike. And in a matter of days, the whole township filled up with mountains and mountains of trash everywhere. And I think... I think it might take seeing that to be able to do what we need to do to address this issue because people are still saying it's not my problem. People don't understand there is no such thing as a way to throw things to. (laughs) There is no throwing away. It's a catalytic moment. It it, it catalyzes the the thought process to actually force people to do something. But all of us in human nature, we we don't like to make changes until we're forced. That's right. Make that change. That's right. Well, you know, if anybody, you know, if anybody reads what's actually going on out there, if you can't translate that, it, most people can, but the hard part is, what can I do? It's just me in right. this in this massive problem and situation. What can I do? And I, if I can offer any inspiration, um, it has to start somewhere. That's right. And we all can do something. Yes. Even even if we're signing petitions to say no more plastic or um, getting uh, communication with our govern governing bodies or the companies that we do business with to say, hey, be accountable, be responsible. We can all make a difference. Well, look at the impact that's happened. It started in Berkeley. Um, you know, they're 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 a nutty bunch up there. God help. God love them. Um, they were the first ones to put a ban on plastic bags. So it started first with, you have to pay 10 cents if you want a plastic bag. And within, I think, I don't, I can't remember, but like four or five years, there's no more plastic bags and no one cares. That's awesome. They've, they've, they've adopted and adapted right. uh, to, to the alternatives. They right. bring their own bags. You know, I mean, well, it unfortunately, and I think it probably does take legislation and there are more and more cities that are uh, making a commitment to be zero waste by a certain by a certain date. So that's happening. I don't know that it's happening quickly enough, but the bottom line here, too, is that there are tremendous economic opportunities in the waste arena. Tremendous, because it is a growing problem, and it is almost like an endless resource. Uh, you know, if somebody can figure out w- ways to do something with plastics, it's it's almost a bottomless pit. No, I think you're going to find in the next, um, I'd say, three years, there'll be a dozen plus remarkable 
uh, plastic conversion technologies. Yes. Um, you know, I'm focused on the fiber uh, and the cellulose, and believe it or not, they're now you can convert cellulose uh, into a plastic. Um, there's a lot of things that um, we could do. We just haven't done them. Right. Because there, because it, there hasn't been an, a, an economic balance and or reward for doing so. Well, and that's shifting. Obviously, that's shifting. And um, I've heard I've heard of uh, plastics being able to be converted to graphene. Yes. I mean, there's all kinds of things that are on the horizon and tremendous opportunity for people that can look around and see a need and take an action toward that. So let me ask you, do you have any uh, images to share with us around what you can do with eCore product? Absolute. Let me see. Cool. Because what's awesome about this is that it is all, just cellulose type fiber and water and pressure and heat, and that's it. And then it will degrade at end of life, right? eCore is... <laughs> a good name we came up with because it's an environmental core material. And it was also a combination of that. And that is, it is a core solution. And so, and it's environmental. So it means a number of things, but um, from a branding perspective, it's, it's stuck. Uh, If we've done anything right, it's been branding. Um, I would say literally hundreds of thousands of people now know what E-Core is. Um, And that's pretty cool. Yeah. And ECOR um, can be, it's a three-dimensional molded fiber. So we can, we can a, a achieve all kinds of different geometries um, and, and uh, eliminate uh, weight. So instead of a desk being, you know, a conference table being four inches thick of material, why not design it like you would an airplane wing? It doesn't have to, it simply has to be, the reason why a, a conference table is so thick is that it has to answer the, its own weight and the deflection which would occur between, between two posts, right? So instead, why not take all that material out of the middle and, and streamline it and make it, make it strong enough to handle the performance demand of it without having to have the weight, which means radically reducing the amount of material needed for that same conference room table. Um, And the array of fibers is endless. And so we trademarked a term called fiber alloys. It's not scientifically accurate, but most everybody gets it. They understand in their car, the alloy or the steel used in a door is very different than the steel used in the wheel or the engine block, if they're still foolish enough to be driving around in an internal combustion engine. Um, so we have been able to take spent brewer grain and, and mix it with um, agricultural waste or, or Tetra Pak or cardboard. Um, for Schiphol Airport, we're taking their miscanthus that they go around the airport uh, f- to prevent bird strikes. Birds don't like miscanthus, so they grow it like you wouldn't believe all around the airport. Oh. all along the runways, uh, but they have to harvest it every year. And, but it's not enough to create a massive market for it uh, to, because miscanthus can be used to make some low-grade papers. Mm-hmm. But we take it and we mix it with the Tetra Pak that they collect from, uh, from the travelers, and they were paying a million dollars a year to dispose of this Tetra Pak waste, and we found a clever way to recycle it and mix it with the miscanthus, and they're now making they're now making a hundred thousand dollars a year selling the Tetra Pak as a feedstock that we then mix with the miscanthus and then sell the board. If I'm still in the picture, I don't know. Um, yeah. So the board uh, back to them that they use in their in their uh, in their facilities. Um, but we've also done hundreds of others from uh, coffee grounds which makes the most exceptionally beautiful panel, beautiful brown panel, not structural, but you sure as hell would love having it layered up on a wall um, is, quite, is quite beautiful. But then some really problematic things. Post-digested cow manure, uh, de-inked office sludge, oh, wow. rice, rice hole waste. This is, a, this is a global problem right here. We're all through China, India, Asia, South America, even here in our own country, 
when we, after harvest, we literally burn the fields. That's just dumb. That's crazy. Um, you know, of course we, and we, again, there's companies attached to all of this. So we've helped educate the companies that the waste streams that they have, even, even indirectly that they're related to, are a value for them of which to incorporate in their own circular economy objectives. Uh, but you go to a company like General Mills, where the Cheerios in a box are, the box itself costs five times more than the Cheerios in it. Well, why not use that oat waste and- Make the box. Make the box. I love and, it. And this, this, this is an economic argument where you can put uh, real, real ceilings on what your, what your material procurement costs will be. Because again, global population increase, middle class increase, that means there's, uh, again, classic economics, a radical increase in demand and a, and, a, and, a, and a steady supply means prices only go one direction. And that's happening actually right now uh, all over the place. Let me see if I can get to some good pictures. Uh, we got great movies. We built an R&D facility uh, in uh, Venlo, the Netherlands, uh, as an educational platform where now 500 companies and cities have brought their waste stream and we collaborate with them and we show them right there on the spot the conversion of their waste into a usable material for their own operations and or that they can use as part of their own contribution to a circular economy. So like a grocery store that gets in thousands of tons of cardboard boxes, because remember everything that went on a shelf came in a box, that now they can take that box instead of selling it and hopefully somebody buys it, they can now contribute it, sell it, into a marketplace where then a furniture manufacturer would then use it in order to make the furniture. So um, we make a massive impact um, both environmentally and socially um, because this will create a ton of jobs. Part of, the, part of the foundation of the circular economy is the decentralization of manufacturing. So everything that was in the 1900s that in the 50s and 60s and 70s, we shifted. We shifted, we said, let's go make massive manufacturing facilities in low labor areas and ship the product to the, where the money is, the buyers. Well, now the buyers are everywhere and the cost of logistics is crazy high. So again, take the materials that are in a region to convert them into where they're gonna be used in that region. And that is the decentralization of manufacturing. Um, and these facilities can be large or small, and you, and you build them in accordance with the needs uh, and the growth plan within any given region. And so every one of our facilities consumes about 34,000 tons uh, per year of this waste, uh, which is this much. <laughs> um, we eliminate a lot of landfill space uh, usage. Um, we recover a tremendous amount of water uh, we use a very modest amount of, of energy and we save a lot of CO2. Now, these numbers here are just traditional recycling numbers. Ours will be ultimately after we do a life cycle analysis, uh, which costs money and time. We'll get that done soon. Um, will be a very big impact. But uh, the other thing is, is we create a ton of direct and indirect jobs in a community. So think about the hundreds of thousands of employees in China working for these massive manufacturers. And instead, you made that two or 300 uh, employees in every single community doing, the, doing, their same, doing their own work. So, you know, part of my dream is to take this into the rural America, uh, into, the, into, the, into, the, into, the, into the Midwest where they're suffering horribly. Um, and convert all of those uh, little cities uh, into um, into e-core operations. I think it'd be major impact. In order for an innovation to take root, uh, you have a decision to make. Do you want it to take root uh, over uh, 25 years? No, we don't have that kind of time. So, um, you know, a, a famous uh, individual in the in the software space, Reid Hoffman, who's a who's a, one of the archetype superstars of all software, PayPal, eBay, all of them. Uh, he came up with a term called blitz scaling, 
which is a twist of the of the of the German Blitzkrieg, mm. which is you attack something and you bring only what you need to win. Don't carry around all the extra weight and uh, and the right go for it. In other words, uh, and that's what we're doing. Um, and the only way that can work is if you have some really big friends uh, that can help carry that load. And so we took our business model and we made it inclusive. In other words, we went to other companies to say, look at our cool technology, validate it. And if you validate it, then you can integrate it and make a ton of money. And so one of the first companies that we brought this to, uh, again, the Dutch, the Dutch, the Dutch, the Dutch, um, they get it. So this is... uh, this information is now slightly dated. We need to bring it up to date. But uh, DSM is a world-class chemical company who their sole focus is health and nutrition. They're awesome. I would recommend anybody that everybody's portfolio should have this company. <laughs> um, I don't know if you can officially re- make that recommendation. I don't know. <laughs> I can make that. Re- I can. I can say yeah. Okay. I can make that recommendation. Obviously. Uh, 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 Everybody has to accept their own risks. Make and you're not, a, are you an official financial advisor? You know, I am just, not, no longer. Okay, so, I, was for, I was for many years, but not any longer. Okay, but, disclaimer. Right, so, <laughs> uh, so this company uh, took our product um, and, and they're, this is a material science company. They have 6,000 material scientists and they took what we gave them and they went to town. And... What they realized was, and they've even used the term holy grail, which is almost embarrassing, um, but they've matched up our material with a 100% recyclable polyester glue. And that right there is an absolute major breakthrough in the furniture industry because no mass produced furniture is recyclable as we mentioned before. And what we've done with them is create a closed loop so that you can have the furniture and when it's and when the furniture's done and again one of my partners has a very eloquent way of putting this he says he fell in love with sustainability when he had his first child and he started realizing for his child that he had to have a crib and then he started recognizing that the cribs he had a choice of had lead content um, had uh, lead paint had voc gassing and he was just appalled at that, and he knew he had to buy something precious uh, to match the preciousness of his child. And when he found Ecor, he 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 says, "Well, now the crib when the child is four, the crib I can now throw it into the hopper, and the crib becomes a school desk or a desk for him to do his his homework uh, at. And when he grows older, maybe it's a dresser uh, or what have you. And so with DSM and their and their division Niagara, which is that recyclable glue, uh, we have now brought these two technologies together, and we're now bringing it out into the market, which is very exciting. I mentioned Heineken um, and all that we've done with them, which we've taken the material and they have turned it into tables and chairs and trays and ice buckets and shelves and lamps and sunglass case holders and tap handles to slip sheets and tear sheets and all kinds of, uh, of uh, crazy things. All right, so we started obviously the panels into, into printed signage, um, some cool stuff here, synthetic leather from a very famous and massive shoe company. This is the factory floor waste that we've converted. Uh, this is um, denim lint. So all these recyclers now that are into, into recycling textiles, they decortify it. In other words, they separate it all. They end up with these six foot high, 10 foot wide chunks of lint that have, <laughs> that have nowhere to go. Wow. And, and you can, it, makes a, it makes a beautiful blue uh, panel that I talked about, like uh, coffee grounds. We've made coffee tables out of coffee grounds. Um, uh, a lot of this is for demonstration because we have to show the whole world uh, everything. They, no one, no one really wants to do any more work than they have to. So we had to design the the technology ready for the market, so it literally just fits in. It doesn't require any extra thought because apparently that's the kiss of death, um, which sadly we experienced. So. 
Whole Foods and signage. And, you know, that was a that was a big hit uh, to making all kinds of POP displays, which this is a big part of our of our sales business today. Uh, we don't want to as a business model. We just want to license the technology to anybody and everybody. So let them do all this. We don't want to be experts in any of these industries. We've, we've gone in and made ourselves and found experts to assist us so that we can demonstrate it, but we don't want to do any of it. So we simply say, want to provide the technology. When you say you're licensing the technologies, uh, technologies so for here, Coca-Cola, are they, <laughs> yeah, they, they have their own manufacturing plant? No, we would, we, would, we would go to Coca-Cola, like Heineken, has tens of millions of points of distribution right. all over the world. Right. But all over the world... They deal with major regional fabricators in each of those regions that produce the products that they design. That Coca-Cola says this represents this is our this is what we want to represent to the public there, right? So, like we celebrate Fourth of July. Obviously, there's no Fourth of July celebration in Malaysia. Mm-hmm. Okay, so they they'll they'll do it to their own marketing. So this is something we would license to those large fabricators that service Coca-Cola. But that same fabricator is already likely servicing Heineken. Right. So he would be the one that we would license it to in order to service Coca-Cola, which then gives Coca-Cola the ability to say, look, we're part of the circular economy because all of our all of our point of purchase displays and signs are being made by our fabricator, which is coming from uh, our waste at the grocery store level and other people's. So you're using Coca-Cola to gain leverage with the fabricator to be able to implement right. your technology. Sarah, we'll use anybody to leverage. To <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I'm just trying to get, like, uh, how do you get something like this mainstreamed? And, uh, and it looks- Coca-Cola has tortured us incessantly uh, <laughs> to make displays for them, but, we've, but we have never actually made anything other than prototypes because the fabricators who work for Coca-Cola want nothing to do with anything new. And Coca-Cola today doesn't have the backbone to tell their fabricator, no, you will make it out of this and you'll make it at the same price that you're making it with the other materials or we'll find somebody else. That hasn't happened yet, but it will. Uh, this um, This is a division of Hunter Douglas a beautiful, beautiful architectural accretive uh, wall paneling company uh, called Three Form. Uh, and we partnered with them and developed all kinds of really cool um, uh, decorative uh, uh, wall panels, uh, which we leveraged and they leveraged us because they wanted to get out of the lobby, right, where all the money spent and they wanted to get upstairs into the into the offices, um, and we gave we helped them uh, achieve that using our our materials. So lots of wall systems, and we've done some amazing things on that. Um, this is a product we invented, uh, which is what we call uh, a think table. It's a lightweight table. It's six feet or no ten feet by uh, four feet, and it, and the legs of the thing weigh more than the table itself. Mm. Um, and it's a whiteboard, so it, it so you can write on it, and oh, it, can, it can be flat, and then you can tilt it up and make it uh, at telescopes as a presentable uh, product. Uh, very cool, very lightweight, as well as some other desks that we've designed. Um, more wall systems and office interior products. We've done a lot of stuff for Google. Um, which is fine in Amazon and Microsoft. We've, we've done everything we can. Um, obviously, we feel that with Niagara and DSM, we're going to be big in the furniture uh, industry in a very big way. Um, we've done a whole bunch of things for in the retail store environment um, for Whole Foods, Starbucks. Uh, we did a huge green pop-up shop uh, for um, uh, H&M, which included some really crazy curves that's one thing, you know, if you go walk outside or just look in your own office, see if you can find a curve. You won't because curves cost money much more so. They're not economic in comparison to a, a vertical, just a flat wall. Uh, we can make curves on demand uh, and, that'll be a, and, and, and that'll be a big thing in the future uh, as well. 
This is um, uh, trade show displays. We made this one for Frank Lloyd Wright's display. It's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, it's all of our all waste material, and it's a uh, with a bamboo laminate, and it's just stunning. Uh, this is one of our most proud projects here. This was uh, Avery's two two story. 20,000 square foot trade show display that went in Europe and it's all, everything you see was made from their label waste. Wow. Very cool. And That's very cool. We've now, taken, we've now taken all of it back and we're processing it into new, into, uh, into new panels. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful uh, this thing. Is a, this is an apartment building that we did all of the cabinetry for. All of our material was given to a, a very good, very avant-garde Carpenter, who made all of these uh, uh, products, you know, from doors to, uh, uh, you know, dressers to uh, all, everything. And it's just fantastic. Um, what else we have? We're going to be big in wall systems. We're working with Hunter Douglas on that. I'll flash through these. Uh, I mean, just window coverings. It's just a huge billions of dollars in business. All of it made from crap. Uh, doors. There's another huge uh, market. Uh, we've got, we must have 30 or 40 designers out there making all kinds of various lampshades by taking our material and laser cutting it and bending it and shaping it uh, into a massive variety. This, of, of course, again, is, uh, is Heineken and all the things that we've done with them. So they brought us into their, uh, into their new facility. The greenest brewery on the planet is in, is in Miyoki, Mexico, Wow. Um, and we made uh, spent brewer grain panels that cover their walls uh, in the bill uh, throughout the building. It's overwhelming. It's endless what you know uh, what we can do, and it's very exciting. And um, I encourage anybody uh, that is looking for a way to participate. We have room for millions of entrepreneurs. All they have to do is just simply dedicate themselves to trying to find a way to introduce uh, and participate in the circular economy. Um, and we'll be a, you know, a huge part of it. In your business model, you're licensing the technology. So what kinds of opportunities are there to sort of jump on this bandwagon that you guys have created? Because the market's only going to grow. Yep. So well, to build one of these factories, to have an e-core facility, how does it work? Well, as soon, first we have to, there's only two things that are required. Time and money. Input. <laughs> Input. So okay. we, have to be able to, we have to be able to contract a waste stream, which that is, trust me, that's not a problem. Trying to get the best deal terms on it and the, and the longest timeline obviously has its own challenges. Um, and then the other, and then even more important is who's going to buy the material on the other end. So what we've spent an inordinate amount of time and money on is is validating not just us, but having these big companies like DSM and and, and Heineken validate uh, the the product because people actually don't want to do their own work. They would just rather just simply copy. Hey, it works well for them, so we should do the same thing. Um, and that, um, that plays a, uh, a whole factor. Um, but all we have to do is just find locations and, and, and every city has at least a half a dozen or more locations. I mean, a city like Chicago will probably have 20 of these facilities in the Chicago land area that will consume, you know, a half a million tons of waste annually and will, and will deliver a half a billion square feet of material to, the, the, the fabricators in that area from the guy fabricating point of purchase displays to the guy fabricating furniture to, um, to the guy who wants to use the technology in making um, uh, uh, heavy transport boxes to lampshades to, again, it's, it's all there. Yeah. And it truly is. Truly Beautiful. is. So if people, if there's somebody out there and I suspect there are people out there that would like to get involved that maybe are designers or maybe want to have one of these facilities. Um, how would they go about? Well, they would contact us. Um, 
you know, we are we are still finishing our our funding needs uh, in order to answer the the demand we've already received. We have been inundated from calls from cities all over the world. Uh, like I said, we did a very good job of branding our our technology, and because we were so early in the market. Uh, we were really, and today, even as nascent as we are, we are literally one of the global leaders in sustainable solutions, uh, yeah. in circular solutions. Um, and word gets around. It's a very small community. That's a good thing. That's it, a wonderful it, thing. But it also is quite daunting. So we can't. We have to. We have to convince the investment community that the demand and interest that we are receiving is legit. That that it that it's that it's actually that there's a there there, um, and as one as one of my as one of my favorite and most hated uh, mentors from 30 years ago, he said there's two things he said that to this day drive me nuts. We are all exactly where we choose to be. So that means somehow I'm responsible for the fact that we haven't solved all of our financial needs. Well, that sucks. You know, I mean, so that that means it's on me. The other thing he said was there's always a long line for second. Oh, interesting. Right. So no one wants to be the first through the breach. No one wants to be on the fronting on the front of a of a command platoon, uh, you know, to be the first one into the minefield. Right. You'd rather be the second guy to see where oh he made it through. So you're just going to stick the exact same right. steps. Right. You know, so, you know, that that's where we are right now. So we have our first commercial facility in Serbia. Uh, we have uh, um, a lot of promise from from people uh, and, and, and family trusts and offices and funds that say they love what we're doing and are going to fund us. But um, so far, I can't, I can't buy a cup of coffee on that yet. <laughs> I hear you. You've got to get that done. So if somebody was interested, it's about 10 million, you've got to assume to build a full, you know, facility. Um, the great thing is that based on the costing and the empirical data that we have on the conversion of that material into a finished product, um, that $10 million facility, even in a developed country, should generate about a uh, 25 and 30 uh, percent uh, annualized uh, return on investment. So it's very attractive uh, from that standpoint, what about cities? Cities are huge, uh, but cities. Why not? Why not approach cities to put these? Well, city, yeah, and we have, but cities are going to take more. It, it, it requires us to have capital to pay for the people that have to hold the hand of the city in order to make end to end meet. So the city simply says, "I have a problem. I have a whole bunch of waste that has nowhere to go, and I'm losing millions. Can you use it?" And our answer is yes, we can use it. But before we can use it, we have to find the buyer for the end product of that material. Before we can buy your waste, we have to find the guy who's going to buy the, the, other, the other side of that equation. Mm-hmm. We have the balance. Um, and that takes time and money mm-hmm. uh, to go out and, again, educate, validate, and then find the action step where then, where then, the, the, then the fabricator, and this is actually, you brought, up a, you brought up a point that I think has to be mentioned, and that is the whole world works when it comes to materials it needs it all works on a just-in-time basis yeah only buy what you need to use they don't buy 10 years worth of material right that's what we have to help educate them into participating in the circular economy means that it's a it's a it's a um, service-based process in other words you just want to rent the material lease the material, be responsible for the recapture of it or help us develop in that own region the recapture of that fiber, right? So then that way everybody is now just expensing their costs and not having to depreciate them. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's going to take, for all the smart city programs, it's just going to take people that we can educate very quickly um, and many of them may be here in your audience for them to become um, what we call uh, circular economy developers. Uh, we have them all over the world right now. We have them in, in uh, Asia. We have them in China. We have them in South America. We have them in the UK. We have them here. They're popping up all over the place. And so we can, we can provide a platform for these people to participate and educate. And then once 
the, the, as these other pieces start to migrate together on how to use the material, who to use it with, um, a step-by-step -step plan for, for those that are introduced to it, to incorporate it, to displace what they're currently buying and accepting what they would buy and doing so on a longer term basis. So it's, it's not uncomplicated, but it is certainly mandated. It has to happen. There is no, there are no options. Yeah. So for folks that are listening, you being the innovator that you are, what a few words of advice might you have for someone to be able to spot an opportunity in the emerging markets around uh, sustainability? Well, there's a, there's a, I would say, having done it so many times, um, I've got a lot of scar tissue. <laughs> uh, and you learn a lot more from your mistakes than you do from your successes. Because, uh, of course, the success is, is something that you wouldn't have done it if you didn't have the assumption or at least the belief that you were going to be successful. So failures are, are it, it, it extraordinarily valuable uh, in the lessons that are taught. So, you know, the famous saying in, in building anything is, uh, and I got this from my father when I was probably, what, eight, which was measure twice, cut once. Uh, so if you find... First of all, if you find something that jumps out at you and your gut says, that's an unbelievable opportunity, don't let it go, A. B, research the shit out of it. <laughs> okay, really dive into, separate it. Uh, you know, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So break up whatever this idea and concept is. Break it up into as small of components and pieces as you can. And then address every single one of them, line them up as to what are the, which ones are gonna be the hardest to overcome and which ones are the ones that could destroy and or uh, create such, such obfuscation of its success that it won't be successful. Politics, that's a lesson I learned in gasification and pyrolysis. Our country was not in the, in the early 2000s acceptable at all to any waste to energy uh, processes because they were already programmed by the waste industry that burning it was going to send all this nasty stuff into the air. Not true at all. Um, so you got to make sure that, you, that things line up and that you identify where those roadblocks are. And first and foremost, focus on those obstacles. Don't try to focus on, on, on trying to get to the, the end game work on the things that are going to, that are going to be really problematic um, in, in, in that becoming the success that you envision. So kind of almost work backwards. So start with the end in mind and work backwards uh, to where you're going to encounter uh, resistance. Uh, and um, uh, what we're starting to focus our time and energy now on is what is going to be and how are we going to address the competitive response um, I mean, we literally are going to gut the entire forest products industry. I mean, we will destroy it. So how do we help them? How do we include them as opposed to ruining them? And that is part of circular economy. It's about licensing the technology, making it actually easier for them to simply do the right thing. Take our technology as their own and use the distribution systems they've paid billions for uh, as their market. I, and that, that's actually, that's the money shot. Like that's the thing that from this interview that is so, so important is inclusivity all the way around, is looking at the impact socially, economically, environmentally, uh, all of it, it becomes really critical to finding a viable solution. I'd say the last thing to, to mention, and, uh, and, and I'll let you go, and that is, um, and you and I touched on it uh, in one of our earlier conversations, um, don't give up. You know, there, you know, I have survived a thousand death blows and somehow magically or other, um, somehow it always works out. Even the, even the, even, you know, I remembered in 2009 um, downloading 
um, a bankruptcy form for one of my corporations. I filled it out. I had really nowhere to turn. There was nowhere to go. And I filled it out and I stapled it to the wall. And I said, I'm not ready to do this yet. I still got blood running through me. I have energy. I have no money to buy food, but that's okay. Well, that somehow will 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 drive through this. And I would say not not even two days later, came a call out of the blue that said, I love what you're doing. I want to participate and I want to help. Uh, and that gentleman today um, is certainly one of my one of my treasured shareholders. Um, but there've been a dozen of those guys since it's like, just keep driving forward. If you go into it with your integrity and transparency on, on what you want to achieve that is bigger than yourself, you'll Thank attract, you. you will attract people everywhere. Thank you for that. Actually, I agree with you a hundred percent. And it's a perfect way to wrap this up is to talk about the power of mission and purpose and vision and and committing yourself to something bigger than yourself. But you know, there's, there's a big part of that too. And it takes incredibly beautiful people like you, Mira, to make it happen. And like you, thank you. It's Providence Moves, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So Jay, thank you so much for being with us. I hope I hope that everybody got the message that there's so much opportunity and we can make a difference, each of us. And it's been really a pleasure speaking well, It's not about us. It's about them. There you go. My babies. Yep. Thank yep. you again. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Keep the momentum going by checking out all the other experts. Every one of them has invaluable information that you can't afford to miss. Buy the Premium Summit Package now. Join the global conversation in our Facebook group and take action in your home, community, or the world at large. Together, we will shape a world that works. <laughs>